This lecture is part of an online algebraic geometry course covering schemes and will be about the cotangent sheaf of a scheme. So the problem is as follows. Um, given a space X, which might be a scheme, well, in differential geometry, we can construct the tangent space, or rather a tangent bundle, Tx of x mapping to x, where the points of the tangent bundle of x are roughly speaking tangent vectors at points of x. And we want to do an analog of this in algebraic geometry. Um, well, there are two analogs of the tangent bundle. We could either construct the tangent bundle as a scheme mapping to x, which we can do, or we can construct a tangent sheaf over x, where the sections of this sheaf, local sections, um, are the same as tangent vector fields. Um, and we'll actually construct the sheaf rather than the bundle, although you, you can construct the bundle from the sheaf without too much difficulty. Um, well, it turns out that instead of constructing the tangent sheaf, it's easier to construct the cotangent sheaf, which is essentially just a sort of dual of the tangent sheaf, at least if x is non-singular. Um, so here the sections are just one forms of the form. Um, so, so if f is a smooth function or a differential manifold, we know that there's you, you can take a, a one form df corresponding to it, which is a, a one form on the manifold. And we want to do the same in algebraic geometry. Well, what you notice in differential geometry that this map d is... Um, an order one differential operator. And it's also normalized. And we discussed last lecture how to construct normalized order one differential operator. So let's just recall very quickly what we did. So here, we, if B is an A algebra, we defined the concept of um, nth order differential operators on B, and we found a universal nth order differential operator as follows. So suppose we set I to be the kernel of the map from B times over A, B to B, just taking B tends to C to B, C. Then we found there's a map from B to um, I to the naught over I to the n plus one, taking B to one tenths of B. And this is a universal order n differential operator. So i to the naught is, of course, just um, to make it clear, it's just b tensor over a b. Um, well, that's not quite what we want. What we want is the map from b to i to the 1 over i to the n plus 1, which is a universal normalized order n operator. So normalized for a differential operator just means d of 1 equals 0. And this map here takes b to b times 1 minus 1 times b. Um, and what we want, well, the operator d, little d we're trying to construct, has order 1, which suggests we should just take this map with n equals 1 here. Um, so we take the map I1 over I2, which has a map from B to it, taking B to B tensor 1 minus 1 tensor B, and we're going to call this map D. And we're going to remember this was the, we, we, we defined this to be the module of differential forms of B over A. And we're going to take this um, um, to be the 
um, cotangent sheaf, at least for affine schemes, and then we'll glue these together to get a cotangent sheaf for arbitrary schemes. So, for instance, let's just check this gives a reasonable result. If B is a polynomial algebra in n variables, then we saw that omega B over A is a free B module with basis dx1 up to dxn. So um, its elements are just things of the form sum of fi times dxi. And these do indeed look like one forms. Um, well, they've got polynomial coefficients rather than smooth coefficients, but that, that, that's close enough. And the map d from b to omega b over a just takes an element f to sum of delta fi over delta xi times dxi, just the same as in differential geometry. So um, what about general schemes x that aren't affine? So that works fine for affine schemes. What about non-affine schemes x? Well, method one, we could cover x by open affines Um, U, I, and glue things together. So we could construct a, um, a module of one forms or, or over each U, I, and just check they're glued together. We're not actually going to do that because it's a minor headache trying to work out how to glue things together. Um, instead, we're going to do it in one step. So... Um, so first of all, let's, let's, let's first look at the affine case where X is the spectrum of some ring B and Y is the spectrum of some um, ring A. Then we've got these maps from B tensor over AB um, to B and A goes like that. And then there's this map taking this to B, which just takes B times C to BC. If we convert this into schemes, what we discover is we've got scheme X times over Y, X mapping to X, mapping to X, mapping to Y. And this map here is just the diagonal um, morphism mapping X to the diagonal of X times over Y, X. And now if we think about what the ideal is, so the ideal I is the kernel of this map here, we see that the corresponding sheaf, so, so what we do is we get a sheaf of ideals, i on x times over y, x, which is just the sheaf of ideals defining the closed subscheme x. Um, so um, um, i over i squared is now um, a sheaf on x times x. And if we pull it back to x by applying delta um, star of i over i squared, um, we now get a sheaf on x, which corresponds to the sheaf um, omega b over a on b. So we define the cotangent sheaf we we'll call this omega x over y on x to be pulled back by the diagonal of i over i squared, where i is, 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 the, is the sheaf of ideals um, of the diagonal embedding of x in x times over y x. Um, and you can check that this is um, um, th 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 this is omega x over y is a quasi coherent um, x um, o x module, and it's coherent if various nice conditions on x are satisfied. I think if x and 
effects is no tune and a finite type over y and so on, then this is coherent. So let's see some examples of it. Well, for affine rings, we've already done several examples. So let's do the simplest non-affine example and just take x to be p, projective space over a field, and y to be um, a point, just the spectrum of the field. And we can ask, what is omega x over y? Well, um, instead of calculating it, I'm going to figure it out by doing some inspired guessing. First of all, it should be the cotangent um, space of P1 of X. And P1 is one dimensional, so it should be um, an invertible sheaf because P1 of X is non-singular, so expect its tangent and cotangent bundles to be to be, to be vector bundles which should correspond to, to locally free sheaves. And we know the locally free sheaves on P1. Local, so, so we know the invertible sheaves on P1. They're just of the form On for N in Z. So the cotangent sheaf is going to be isomorphic to On for some value of N. And we want to know what is N. Um, well, we can figure it out as follows. So sections of O n have n zeros on P1. So we can figure out what n is by figuring out how many zeros a differential form has on P1. So, so if we choose coordinates x, y for P1, we can take an a1 in P1 with coordinates x and just look at the differential form dx on a1 and try and figure out what it does at infinity. And so we can figure out how many zeros it has. We need to work out how many zeros dx has. We notice dx is non-zero on affine space. So let's work out what happens at infinity. So we put y equals one over x and we find dy equals minus one over x squared dx dx is equal to minus 1 over y squared dy. So we see there is an order 2 pole at infinity. So the sheaf of 1 forms on P1 is isomorphic to O of minus 2, because there are minus 2 zeros. There's, there's a double pole of any one form. Um, Actually, we may as well take a quick look at the tangent bundle or the tangent sheaf, which can be defined as the dual of the cotangent sheaf, which is the dual of O of minus two, which is O of two. So, um, so tangent vector fields just correspond to sections of O of two. So we can figure out what the dimension of the space of global tangent vector fields is is the dimension is just three because O of two has a three dimensional space of sections. In fact, if we like, we can write down what these tangent vector fields are. They're just D by DX x d by dx, and x squared d by dx. And you may take a look at that and say, why do you stop at x squared by d by dx? What on earth is wrong with x cubed d by dx? Well, it turns out that x cubed d by dx has a pole at infinity. So if we look at infinity, as before, we put y equals 1 over x and take a look at what happens when y equals 0. Well, d by dx is equal to d by dy times minus 1 over x squared. So d by dx becomes minus y squared d by dy, and this becomes minus y d by dy, and this becomes d by dy, and this becomes minus 1 over y d by dy. So, so this 
one here is not acceptable because it's got a polar infinity. And we see that there are there's a three-dimensional space of holomorphic vector fields on, on the projective line. Incidentally, these form a basis for the Lie algebra of the automorphism group of the projective line. And the automorphism group of the projective line is just the projective general linear group PGL over two of K, which has dimension three. So its Lie algebra is indeed three dimensional. Um, okay, well, that was a sort of uh, calculation of the cotangent bundle of the projective line where we sort of cheated a bit by doing a bit of wild guessing. Now let's work out the cotangent bundle of n-dimensional projective space. Um, well, what we get is um, an exact sequence, naught goes to omega of p to the n, goes to O of minus one to the n plus one, goes to O of zero, goes to naught. And this will give a slightly more honest calculation of the cotangent bundle of P1, because for n equals one, this just corresponds to the sequence naught goes to O of minus two, goes to O of minus one plus O of minus one, goes to O of zero, which we mentioned a few times when we were, when we were discussing um, sheaves on the projective line. Um, so how do we um, prove this? Well, the easy way is to look at, at graded modules over k x naught up to x n. So we have the following sequence of graded modules. Um, maybe I should take a new piece of paper because this is going to take a fair amount of space. Um, we get naught goes to uh, things of the form sum of fi dxi with sum of fi xi equals zero. And th then this goes to a free module with basis dx1 up to dxn, so dx0 up to dxn. And this is just omega of k x0 up to xn. And then this maps to k x0 up to xn. And this maps to k and this maps to zero. And the map here just takes dxi to xi. So it, it, it doesn't have image one, which is why we get a K there. So um, we've got this sequence of graded modules over the polynomial ring um, in N plus one variables. And now you remember that if we've got a graded module over the polynomial ring, this gives us a family of sheaves over projective space. And th this family of sheaves is going to look like this. We get omega, um, of Pn, as we will show shortly, and um, a free module with basis dx0 up to dxn. Well, well we have xi has degree 1, so um, this is a sum of n plus 1 copies of something that is either O1 or O minus 1, and it's really hard to remember which, and I think it's O minus 1. And here we've got a free module and one generator, so we just get O of 0, and here we get k, and you remember finite dimensional graded modules, when you turn them into sheaves, they just become zero. So um, um, we've got this slightly odd phenomenon. This map of graded modules is not surjective, but the corresponding map of sheaves is surjective. Um, so, um, so that correspondence and that correspondence are uh, easy to see. And what we've got to do to finish off is to show that the sheaf omega of p to the n corresponds to this graded module over the polynomial ring. And to see this, we remember that p n is covered by open sets um, 
uh, ui, where xi is not zero, roughly speaking. And um, the coordinate ring of ui can be taken to be kx um, naught over xi up to xn over xi. And the, um, the, the, the one forms over this, so omega of this ring is just a free module spanned by dx um, x naught over xi up to dxn over xi. So there are only n of these because, of course, dxi over xi is equal to zero. Um, uh, on the other hand, if we look at this graded module here, uh, the sheaf corresponding to it, um, so if, if we take the graded module of things, sum of fi dxi with sum of fi xi zero, um, the, 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 the corresponding, for, to get the corresponding sheaf over each open set ui, you, you take the module of degree zero elements um, of, um, um, of the module you get by inverting um, xi. So ui is where xi is non-zero. So we're just looking at the um, elements sum of fi dxi such that sum of fi xi equals zero and um, the degree of fi dxi is equal to zero and fi is in k x naught up to xn and then we allow x naught to be inverted. Um, and now you can check that if you we ignore for the moment the condition about the degrees and just ask for the things satisfying this condition, you can see these are spanned by um, as a module by x i d x sorry x j d x i minus x i d x j. You can see that this now satisfies the condition that sum of f i x i equals naught, and conversely, if this satisfies this condition, you can easily check that it's a linear combination of these. Now we make this degree zero, and we see that we're just getting the elements x, j, d, x, i minus x, i, d, x, j, and now we can make it degree zero by dividing by the square of d, x, i. Um, and, uh, well, if we go back, the omega was the free module satisfied by these things here, well, d, x, j over x, i is just equal to dxj times xi minus xj times dxi over xi squared. So in other words, if we take the um, sheaf corresponding to this graded module, um, it's canonically, we can canonically identify it with the sheaf of one forms over each of these open sets ui and therefore over the whole of projective space. Um, so uh, that identifies the cotangent space of projective space. Um, next lecture we'll be doing some more examples of the cotangent sheaf.